My role today is to talk a little bit about the genetics in paraphilia. And we're at the age of genetics where we have the capacity to do a lot. Uh, and the problem is, is that we know very little about how to use it uh, and whether or not doing genetic testing is actually useful. So I want to share with you today really what is the evidence that genetics is helpful for clinical outcomes, for um, surveillance, and so forth. So what do we actually know? And we promise a lot, but what do we actually know? Um, and so, oh boy, so you can't really see down at the bottom, but this, the talk was initially targeted towards physicians and patients, so um, I'll try to make sure I keep my terminology understandable, but please ask questions as I go along or afterwards for clarification, and of course we're here uh, throughout the next couple of days. Okay, so historically, uh, this is going back in, in 2001 or so, you can think about testing uh, across the board about whether or not it's effective uh, and worthwhile doing or, or not worthwhile doing, more likely to be harmful. And the main determinant on whether or not genetic testing is actually useful is whether or not there is a pre-symptomatic, so before you develop problems, intervention that actually changes the outcome. You need that in order to justify testing. So in 2001, uh, RET mutations or multiple endocrine neoplasias was one of the early useful genetic tests because you could get total thyroidectomy and we knew that that was helpful. Uh, other things like breast cancer and colon cancer, initially it wasn't clear that actually that genetic testing is useful. At this point, those have moved over into the higher utility category, but you have to cross the threshold of demonstrated utility before really it can be adapted into widespread practice. And so one of the questions that we're trying to figure out is on this spectrum, where are we right now with SDH? And uh, you can help be the, be the judge of that for yourself. But sorry that these things are so low. Probably people in the, in the back can't see them. But uh, genetic testing generally is appropriate uh, when um, you have a, a high likelihood of identifying someone who will develop a complication, so there's a high penetrance. And also when you can tell family members, oh, you don't have to worry about this. So exoneration. Sometimes we overfocus on saying like what tumor someone is going to develop and we forget it's also very helpful to tell family members that they're not at risk. Uh, and then also you need to show that there's utility in terms of reduced mortality. Um, and so here's a sort of a, a quick table uh, about how one weighs uh, the usefulness of, of genetic testing. So first, uh, for diseases that have high morbidity or mortality, that means if you were to develop manifestation, would there be significant consequences? So usually oncologic diseases fall into this category. And for the S and for paraganglionomyofibromocytoma, it somewhat depends on exactly which gene it is, whether or not this is considered to be uh, a high morbidity mortality. You also need to have an effective treatment. So for paraphio, we know surgery when done early is pretty effective, and when done late is not as effective. So clearly we sort of cross that threshold uh, there. Uh, the other question is, is genetic testing predictive? And I'm gonna go into more detail about what, whether this is a yes, no question. Uh, and I'll hold off on that. And then is there a high cost to screening? So if it was cheap to screen, then everyone would get it and you wouldn't need the genetics. But if it's expensive to do, then you need to do targeted screening. Uh, and so for paraphilia, yeah, whole body MRI is expensive. We have to figure out whether or not that's worth doing or not. Um, okay. So uh, I didn't know how to work this into the talk, but one very important point and concept in genetics is that you always want to test the affected individual. I know this is complicated because sometimes that person is deceased, but whenever possible, it's most informative if a person with the actual tumor manifestation is genetically tested. And there are some ways to capture tissue and so forth, so just have that in mind. Okay, I'm so sorry. The coloring is going to be very hard to see. Can I, can, yeah. All right, so yellow was definitely a bad choice. <laughs> All right, so what are the major ethical considerations? So, so as my training is in <clears throat> internal medicine, clinical genetics. Um, and so when we think about genetic testing, we have to consider the ethical implications of, of, of what we're doing. And in general, patients or individuals who undergo genetic testing should do so in an environment where these ethical principles are held 
and their personal choices and freedoms are recognized. So that, the first principle of genetic testing is autonomy. Uh, and the, the underlying principle is the right to choose. So when a person decides to have genetic testing, they shouldn't be coerced, they shouldn't feel pressure, they should in their own mind have heard the information and make an informed decision. Unfortunately, in this particular condition, we have children involved. And so we have to serve as their autonomy. Uh, and that's uh, a difficult decision for many of us. I think Dr. Patrick highlighted how, how this turns on its head when they turn to 18. So I, I think um, I'm not gonna provide an answer of what to do here, but this is a discussion that has to be done in an informed way. Uh, beneficence and non-maleficence basically means that the intent of the testing should be to do good and not to do harm. Um, and we have to think about what are the consequences that are harmful. So that's usually anxiety, extra testing, time away from work, those types of things. Uh, and justice, it, which means that basically people should have equal access to this testing. It shouldn't be restricted to, to some specialized class. Uh, the way our insurance system works presently, it's not clear that that's always the case. A lot of our patients do pay out of pocket for genetic testing for a paraphio. It just sort of depends upon the circumstance. So that's a systemic problem. And then confidentiality and privacy. So you have to worry, formally there was a big fear about whether or not your health care is this a pre-existing condition with GINA, uh, which is a congressional act to protect people with pre-existing conditions, genetic conditions, that's pretty good. I mean, that of course rests on the stability of, of law. Um, but the other issue that comes up, life insurance, we can't protect that, that's based upon your history. Um, and the only other place of privacy comes in is duty to warn. So if you have a genetic test, it implies it's a familial con condition, and you may not wanna share that result with someone else. This comes up very, very frequently. And now, what's the physician obligation to inform that, that other family member? Typically, we recommend we write a letter and we ask you to share it. We don't violate the individual's uh, right to keep it, per to not share this information. It's their personal health information. The principle that bars us from telling or, or allows us to tell another family member uh, is this principle of duty to warn, which is based upon imminent danger and a genetic condition doesn't typically rise to that level, uh, although there are cases that exist where the, where the physician have lost for familial, for familial colon cancers. They didn't tell a family member they developed colon cancer and the doctor was found to be responsible for not informing them. So there's risks on the physician side too of not telling people. Okay, so now let's go back away from principles and go to the specifics. What about hereditary paraphio? What are the genetics? So if you test uh, roughly 500 people and say, we're gonna do a very broad scan of germline testing of what mutations you have. This is the dis roughly the distribution of tumors that you see. SDHB is about 5% of, of the tumors. SDHA, surprisingly, f comes up in a pretty high level, it's about three and a half. And then so forth, there's, there's a cascade down. What it, this sums up to, and people have given you very different numbers, and the, answer, the reason is, is because we all use slightly different data. Uh, and some people will say it's 40% hereditary. Uh, some data say it's about 22% hereditary, so you end up with this 20 to 40% hereditary. And that's somewhere in there is right. The specific answer probably doesn't matter. It's high enough that it's, that it's of concern. So, um, but what you'll also note is that there's many, many genes. And so only a subset of these are actually tested. Okay, and this is a complicated problem, but one I wanted to emphasize. So these traces are, are technology that's used for sequencing, for reading DNA. And what you'll see here is that you get single peaks, right? But down here, there's a second little peak. There's a green underneath the black, and this is in someone's peripheral blood. And we see a lot of noise when we do sequencing, so maybe that's nothing. But then when you sequence the tumor, it's now 50-50. And so what I'm trying to highlight here is that some people come from multiple fertilization events or can have changes in their DNA early on in development and are actually mosaic. So it th seems to be that in about 1% of cases, 
uh, of these tumors, there's, there's uh, mosaicism. So we do blood testing, it's normal. But the tumor can have a germline mutation. Whether or not that germline mutation gets transmitted to the next generation or not in these individuals is variable, and we don't know the frequency. But again, this is now a, a, a sort of a loophole in our genetic testing. It's not perfect. It's not perfect by a long ways. This is a 1% error. OK, so now what's the current recommendations? This is sort of going back to 2014, 2015 from the Endocrine Society. They say that everyone with a paraphio should engage genetics. They don't go as far as, say, genetic testing, but everyone should be engaged by genetics. Uh, and then they say, do the testing by algorithm. I mean, this gene, this gene, this gene. I think at this point, there's very, very strong support. That there's too many genes to do that. Sure, there's, there's specific tumors that we know are very likely to be a specific gene, but it's just as cost effective as to just do the whole panel and, and get it done with. So panel testing is where we're at. And I think we're moving almost towards exome sequencing, which means just test every gene because we're up to you know, 17, 18, 19 genes. At what point does it become just more effective to just look across the genome? Uh, and then the other recommendation is that management should be personalized. So your genetics can influence uh, how you're taken care of. OK. So now this is going back to the question of what's useful to know? Is genetics useful in managing someone who has a paraganglioma or pheochromocytoma? So this is looking at patients who have either a para or pheo, uh, And there's, the question is, do they develop a new event? And in this particular cohort, it was roughly 10% of people had a second event after undergoing surgery, after undergoing their initial management. And if you look at who is likely to have recurrent events, it's the extra adrenal locations, uh, people who are younger are more likely to have a recurrent event. And then all the way down here where you can't see is that there's a, about twice the risk of having a second event if you have a germline mutation. So you do genetic testing, and when you identify a mutation, those individuals have about twice the risk of having a secondary problem. So just on this basis, you'd say, okay, maybe genetic testing is useful. It says I'm at increased risk. And this is irrespective of genotype. <coughs> OK, this is uh, a typical test report from Invite, something that we often use. Uh, this is a fairly large panel where we just went ahead and we did you know, like the 90-something gene panel. And what you'll see highlighted are the genes that we sort of have linked, many of them strongly, some of them weakly, to paraphio. And then underneath, you'll see all the other genes that we've sort of linked to hereditary paraphio, but are not on this screen. So these probably don't sum up to more than a percent or so. But when we send someone with, when we get a genetic test result and we say, oh, you don't have a germline mutation, we also say, stay in touch with us. And we have to think very carefully about what their actual presentation is, what their family history is. But negative, if you get a positive result, usually that's pretty strong, meaning, OK, you have a mutation, you probably do have hereditary condition. When you get a negative result, there's always the question of, well, what did you miss? So stay in touch, I guess, is the bottom line. Um, OK. I guess maybe I'm maybe not pointing to the right location. Um, OK, so genetic testing, we'd like it to go global, and we'd like everyone to be able to do it, but it's not a yes, no answer. The test report will give you a categorization of your variant. Anything from pathogenic, which means, OK, we're pretty sure this causes, we have a lot of evidence to say it does. Variant of likely pathogenic, we also treat as if it causes the particular condition. But then the, carry, the category of variant of undetermined significance, this is where there's not necessarily contradicting data. There's just not sufficient data. And by, clinic, by genetic counselor training and by clinical practice, those people are told, you, we cannot use this variant to manage your condition. That's the right practice across the board. Unfortunately, for paraphio, we see a huge amount of recategorization from VUS to likely pathogenic or pathogenic. So we think about doing secondary analyses. There are sort of tests on the tumor, immunohistochemical tests on the tumor. We do in silico uh, modeling. Is this a mutation that affects the folding of the protein? There are a lot of high-level analyses you can do to help yourself interpret these mutations. 
And so if you have a VUS, I encourage you to hang on to that and stay in touch and maybe even share it with someone else who uh, does more of the sort of in silico and modeling data. Uh, Paraphio societies have also dealt their own categorization because that other grouping doesn't work so well, so they have their own. I'm not going to go through it. Okay, so many people probably would think that we'd go through the whole talk saying, gene, this is the problems that occur with it. Gene, this is the problem. This is so complicated. I think we're past the point where we can actually do that. This is a, a somewhat of a summary of what happens with each of the tumors, with each of the germline mutations. The, the main points here that I wanted to make was first, uh, you've heard this before, but SDHD and SDHAF2, those are both, uh, those both cause tumors when they come from the father but not from the mother. With rare exception, uh, we still manage the children of the mother by screening. I'll go into that a little bit later. But those are tumors, are, those risks of a tumor are inherited from the father. But you'll see that, sc that screening needs to be gene specific, uh, that we think about renal cell carcinoma um, in the SDHs, GIST and pituitary adenoma are the main things uh, that have to stay on the radar. Okay, so I told you at the beginning of the talk that penetrance is sort of everything and when you think about the utility of gen genetic screening. It's not useful to know if someone has a, a pathogenic mutation if they're never gonna develop a tumor or they do at a less than 1% rate. So what is the actual penetrance of SDH-related disease? And so here's a study where it's looking at the manifestation. So these are patients. What's the likelihood that someone developed a tumor across the age spectrum? And we're using the proban, which is the person who has a tumor and comes to clinical attention, plus their relatives who are the non-proban. And what you'll see is that for SDHD, that's the blue line up there, it's roughly 75% of people developed a tumor. For SDHB, it's around 50% or so, okay? Now, if you look at what's the likelihood that they develop malignant disease, metastases, for SDHB, it comes to roughly 20%, uh, and the others are, are lower. But remember now, we're thinking about the people who came to attention with the tumor, as well as their relatives. But what happens for SDHB, let's say, when you only, you saw this in Dr. Patrick's talk, what happens when you only focus on the family members, right? Because you said someone had, got someone had a tumor, got tested, and then now I'm screening all their family members, what's the likelihood that they develop a tumor? So let's say for the head and neck, for paraphio, the, your risk is roughly 60%, 50-60% if you include both the proban and the relatives. But if you just look at the relatives, your risk of developing a tumor, a paraphio, is about 20%. So it's, it's much, when you take out the person who presented, the penetrance is much lower. The same is true for metastases. So the, malig the malignant disease risk is much higher in the first person who comes to attention than in the, the relatives. This may be because, okay, now we're doing genetic testing. This may be because, and it's of course not universal. Right? This is, these are on average. Uh, I thought what's notable about this particular data was that if you look at the incidence of renal cell carcinoma or kidney cancer, it didn't matter whether or not you included the, the proban, the presenting person, or not. The risk was roughly 5%. So that says that the risk of renal cell carcinoma is probably independent of your risk of a paraphio. Right? That's, the, that's the takeaway here. Um, so overall, um, is there a timer? Because I have no idea how long it's been. Three minutes? Okay, I gotta go quick. Okay. So for the non-proban, the penetrance I, I've, I've put over here, it's about 20%, 25% for SHC, and about 50% for SDHD. Okay, we've also come into the era of population statistics. So now we don't have to limit ourselves necessarily to, in all cases, to individually collected samples. We can try to look at databases. And so this is analysis looking at the frequency or the penetrance of SDHA, B, and C using more uh, data, database interrogation. And for SDHA, the overall penetrance is all the way down to around 2%. We've always had a sense that SDHA is low, but that's, that's quite low. 
SDHB stays at about 20%, so the, this for parafio, the likelihood is about 20%. SDHC is about 8% by this analysis. What's really interesting from this data is that the population risk of a parafia was one in 3,000. So we've heard over and over again how rare this is, but by this statistical analysis, it's one in 3,000. And so that fits with some autopsy studies that have been done versus uh, other types of population studies that probably this is more common or significantly more common than we've, we've appreciated until now. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to skip over some of the stuff because I think this, some of the key data are, you do biochemical screening, why am I doing biochemical screening? What's the usefulness of it? So here, these are individuals who were screened, these are individuals that weren't screened, uh, and then they were, when, at the time they were found to have a tumor. Symptoms like, such as diaphoresis were significantly less likely than people who didn't have screening. So the tumors were caught before symptoms developed. This is sort of the evidence that biochemical screening is useful. There's very limited evidence to show that it's useful. If you use blood pressure, so doing biochemical screening versus just randomly finding people with tumors, the blood pressures of the population, they're hardly different. Blood pressure is not a useful screening device. Okay, so the main takeaway was the tumors were quite a bit smaller when you screen by biochemistry than when you just present normally, just come to clinical attention. But if you look at how long it took before surgery was done, uh, the sporadic population, no screening, it was 80 days before they went to surgery. If you were screened biochemically, it's more than a year on average before you go to surgery. So we can find these tumors, but be prepared. They're gonna be found early, and there's gonna be some time till we wait until the right moment, we know enough. You have that time for this disease, usually, but that's part of the cost, right? Knowing early allows you to be prepared, but there's time. Um, this is data looking at people who underwent biochemical screening and full body MRI and saying, trying to compare the usefulness of them. The main thing uh, to take away is that the sensitivity by this study was 37% by biochemistry, but if you're doing simultaneous MRIs, you pick up about 87%. So biochemistry is good, but you're missing a lot that you would get. Um, I'm, I'm pretty much out of time, right? <laughs> it's a little bit, okay. So, uh, so the last thing I just sort of skipped ahead to is, have we shown that there's actually a positive impact to doing genetic testing? So if I have a tumor and you test my genetics and you tell me I have a mutation, does that change things for me? That's something that we've never demonstrated before. And this is a very recent publication where they're looking at that question. And what they say is actually, people who underwent the genetic testing uh, tended to have smaller tumors resected. Um, they had less metastatic disease. Um, that um, the likelihood of them having complications were lower. And their survival time was longer. So this is probably uh, overall, because, mostly because these patients were followed up on. There was a higher level of, of concern on the physician side. Uh, and also probably because the patients were more engaged in, in, in their condition. So these data would say that genetic testing of an individual with a parafio actually, just that knowledge changes the way things are done such that there's improved outcome. Okay, the last slide, which and then I'll, I'll stop, which is that there are lots of recommendations, and, there, and everyone, I think, has given sort of some of theirs. They're mostly overlapping, but you'll see almost everyone agrees that you do biochemistry. There's some argument about when that should start. Most of us would say, well, it's blood testing. Starting around age five to seven is reasonable. It doesn't cost that much. Um, you're, of course, the children at that age aren't aware exactly, but it becomes normalized, and they're, they're not. Uh, aware of what's going on. Then how to do imaging is highly variable. What age to start at, very variable. Anything from age eight up to age 18. Uh, and then functional imaging, I think Lauren really handled that. I think that's preserved for certain circumstances. 
This happens to be my overall approach. The idea is that I do biochemistry usually starting very young. Uh, I tend to, and this is, I know I'm over imaging. I know that. I know that this is going to be changed and that as we learn more, this will be unnecessary. But I do start with annual imaging in, let's say, the SDHBs and Ds uh, because I want that to be proven wrong and then I can, I, I, I can relax. Uh, and of course, everyone's individual. As people get old, we change things as, as time goes on. That happens to be my practice. What to do with these SDHAs who have a 2% penetrance? That's very hard. I have my own take. I'm sure everyone else has, has theirs. Uh, and then, of course, there's the other conditions. So overall, the, the main things I wanted to say was first, to thank everyone for, for uh, their attention. And then second, to say we're really at this junction where we have so much information that we don't know how to use. But it's clear already that genetic testing is useful. There are things that we can do, and we can change prognosis. So I strongly uh, recommend it. It's recommended by our societies, uh, and we'll figure out how to tailor things as, as, we, as we move along. Uh, so thank you.